and then the clock clicked eight. Can everybody hear me? Just a wave a hand, a nod, a smile, outstanding. Um, welcome everybody to my basement. My name is Joseph Green and I am the CEO of LMS Voice and I am super excited to be here with you all this afternoon. I didn't formally prepare any comments so I'm just gonna shoot from the hip. Uh, this is absolutely amazing. The idea that we could be here with so many people from across the country, maybe even the world to celebrate poetry and to come together in the midst. And I've heard all, I know you've all have heard this in the middle of one of the, the most unhinged times um, that I can remember in my lifetime uh, and, and just find joy in having conversation with one another and listening and appreciating people who are from different places and different spaces and have different experiences than us. Um, the idea that we could be a part of facilitating that um, for people is something that I am very proud of. Um, this uh, organization, LMS Voice, was born of another organization um, called Poetry Now that I co-founded with Brian Hannon, who I'll introduce to you in a moment. Um, and it has just always been our goal to make resources available to people that um, enhance their experience here on this little planet of ours. And so um, this is one of those things. This was Brian's idea. And uh, when I heard it, I was like, more work. But then I was like, okay, let's try it. Um, and he took the reins and he, and he made it happen. So we have two amazing young people who are going to um, be our host this evening. And um, I'm gonna let them introduce our special guests whom I'm assuming most of you know, but uh, I'll, I'll save it for you know, the proper introduction because I don't wanna mess up anyone's bio. But uh, I just wanna go over a couple of um, house rules before we, we jump into things. Um, one, uh, there's a chat here. Please, please, please communicate in the chat um, with one another, um, share poems, resources, thoughts, ideas, um, send love to our, our young hosts who are doing this type of thing for the first time. Um, I know that you will send love and enthusiasm and support to um, our guest. Uh, but yeah, meet each other. Let that be a place for us to network and grow and um, and please keep it positive. Um, there's really not a lot of interaction between the audience and uh, the, the, the people who are doing the interview and the interviewee, but uh, that's just one way for us to communicate. So um, in the spirit of keeping things positive, please keep the chat positive, but use it. Um, Additionally, uh, there are going to be some announcements um, as we go through. The one thing that I wanted to talk about before we get started, other than that one little house rule of um, please use the chat, is that uh, this is in celebration of the very long launch um, of our new website at LMS Voice. Um, and it's simply lmsvoice.com. It is a education and wellness resource site uh, for humans. Uh, there's a lot of academic stuff on there, but it's for anybody. And we will be adding new lessons and curriculums and videos and things of that sort um, every month until we can't afford to do it anymore. Uh, and it will always be free to the public. So if you are interested in um, this writer and many other writers of the same elk, then you should definitely check out the website. There are a lot of um, beautiful uh, workshops there, essays and poems, and soon to be lots and lots of videos and other things of that sort. And if you'd like to collaborate with us on any of this, we would love for you to reach out. Um, periodically, I will be putting our information into the chat. Okay. All right. I got 30 seconds left. Here we go. Um, on behalf of LMS Voice, um, my mama, who could not be here today, my two sons, um, and Brian Hannon, uh, who I would like to introduce to you right now. Um, I am super excited to have you here. Brian Hannon, would you like to say anything before we open it up for our host? Uh, sure, I just want to say thank you for coming out. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you being here. We appreciate you, Brian, um, and the balance you provide uh, my verboseness. So without any further ado, um, I bring to the virtual stage our two amazing hosts. Please put your um, hands together or in the air or snappity snap, whatever it is, to um, welcome Milka and Kenny Carroll. Woo! 
Hello, everyone. I How are like, you doing? Yeah, what's up, everybody? Uh, I don't know if I'm highlighted yet, but I'm here too. If you can just hear my voice now, that's fine. I assume it's good. Uh, so yeah, what's up, everybody? Um, as was said, I am Kenny. This is Milka. Uh, we got bios. I think we're we're gonna read them for y'all just so you can know who we are real quick. Um, I'm gonna read Milka's. I'm gonna read it now. Uh, Milka Mered is from Northern Virginia. Uh, she graduated from William and Mary and is a Di diversity and inclusion fellow at William and Mary currently. She also loves Mayo, which doesn't really track or make sense, but these are the, you know, the duality of people. You know what I'm saying? But uh, that is Milka. For all my Mayo fans, you understand the love is real. So can you just get on the train? and it'll be a good time. But let me introduce Kenny Carroll. He'll be one of our hosts tonight. Um, he's from DC. He's a poet, a teacher, and now host. Um, he can't read in the car. So for all y'all that can relate to that. Um, and you'll hear him featured um, on Rico Nasty's songs every time you hear Kenny. Um, I always think of Kenny. So thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to have a great time being yeah. a host with you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if if you also can't read in the car, you can put that in the chat. Uh, <laughs> we have to connect with each other as people. We have to build that community because, you know, we're out here. Um, but yeah, uh, super excited. Milka, are you feeling good? I'm feeling great. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, y'all probably didn't come for us, but maybe you did. Who knows? I mean, we, we cool. But uh, you probably came for um, this poet who we're about to read about. Um, I'll say before we read her bio, uh, one of my favorite poets, I mean, she, your poet, your, your favorite poet's favorite poet, I think is, is, is the word that people say. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into it. Um, Safia El Hilo is the author of The January Children, which if you, if you don't have, you know what I'm saying? Go get that. That's the old one. Um, let's read the bio. Safia El is the author of The January Children, which received the Sillerman First Book Prize for African Poets and Arab American Book Award. Uh, she is the author of Girls That Never Die and the novel in verse Home Is Not a Country, which you should pre-order. We'll tell you about that later. Uh, with Fatima Asgar, she is co-editor of the anthology Halal If You Hear Me. Uh, she's also a Sudanese by, by way of Washington, D.C., and Safia received the 2015 Brunel International African Poetry Prize and was listed on Forbes Africa's 2018 30 Under 30. Her work has been translated into several languages, and her commissions include Under Armour, Quiana, and the Bavarian State Ballet. And in 2018, she was awarded, awarded Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, and she currently is Wallace is a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and lives in Oakland. So you can tell Safia is a very busy, very accomplished woman, and super excited to learn more about her. Cool. We're gonna put her uh, Instagram and Twitter, and also uh, pre-order uh, for Home Is Not a Country in the chat. But just so y'all know, her Instagram is Safia Mafia, and her Twitter is Mafia Safia. You love, you, you love the branding. Um, so I think we said all we needed to say and we got that out the way. So uh, it, we're also here uh, based on um, the poet, the poem that is featured in uh, LMS Voices uh, site. So Safia, if you want to come on and read it, that'd be tight. Um, without further ado, Safia, hello, hello. Ah, ah, make noise. Ah. So can't hold us. Um, hi everyone, thank y'all so much for having me. Um, I did not think this through in advance, so I need to pull up my poem. So this is me bantering until I can get to the thing that I need to read to you. Um, terrible weather we're having here in Oakland these days, or uh, as one should call it, Southern Oregon, because California branding is incorrect, it's cold here. I'm wearing a turtleneck in California. Um, can I pin, I don't know that I have the powers to pin myself, but um, I think someone uh, on the other end has the power to yeah. do that to my video. Where is that be? Okay. Oh, okay, there we go. I see myself. Um, okay, 
sorry about that terrible banter. Um, in memory of Kamal Brathwaite, I sat by the lake and ate five tiny oranges and every strand of flesh and pith was my teacher. I grew warm and soft in the sun and from this ripening made a poem to search for my teacher. I hear in every syllable its older drum. For this first part of my life, my ancestor was alive. My ancestor was kind and my ancestor was my teacher. I learned music as the bright flesh of the poem. I learned percussion as its pith. I learned to listen to my people speak and harness my many mouths to write, my many mouths to music, my people as my teacher. I want badly to write well. I want badly for my teacher to remain or return, to explain again about the drum, draw a circle for me to stand inside. I want more than I dare write. I want more than I understand. I want porous borders to the other world to part and reveal him there, my teacher. I want the lake and its secrets. I want enormous things, the audacity for words previously not mine, since poured from my softer places. I know enough to believe the miracle of my faith, not resurrection and not water, but the book. I want badly to explain something about music, something exact and pure, but what is more polluted than language? language hollowed to an instrument by my selfish grief. You were enormous as a god and you were kind to me. And from that brief overlap, I sit down every time to write, hands fragrant with pith and peel. I want to grow larger than my morning, my ancestor beside me on the long walk to the poem, the long walk around the lake, and now I will begin again, visited in sleep and here by my teacher. Amazing. Give it up, Sasaki. There's Amazing. no real, there's so many people, everybody clapping. Uh, if we could, yeah, yeah, do your, do your snaps in the chat, do your claps in the, whatever. Uh, but yeah, um, that is a poem, and I think we also probably have a link for this too, if you want to read it, um, read whatever Safia produces. But also, what's up, Safia? Welcome. Welcome Hi. To um, so yeah, we got like a bunch of questions for you. Um, so hopefully we'll get through at least half of them. No, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I should be more optimistic. Um, but uh, first thing, well, first things first, that was great banter. Uh, second thing, because I didn't, I thought all- I'm really that. flailing when I started talking about a turtleneck before I read a poem. That's, that's my cry for help, if you ever hear me do that again. I think you said that. Though, and I think it was simple to you, but as a person who doesn't, I'm not on the West Coast, what you said almost broke my heart. Like, <laughs> I was like, I, you know, I feel like in my head, and Milky, you can attest to this too, like, in my head, at least if you go West Coast, it's warm. Like, it's like 30, minus 30 degrees here in D.C. But I feel like in my head, it's like, it's warm over there. That's the bill of goods I was sold to. It's cold. My roof is leaking. It's oh, no. <laughs> sun hasn't come out in like five days um i don't know maybe la is better i love oakland but it climate wise southern oregon wow that's and you know if you don't if you don't take away anything today take away uh oakland is southern oregon uh shout out oakland okay but anyway the poetry poetry because obviously that's what we're here for um so uh the honorable edward Kamal brath white was a Barbadian poet and academic, widely considered one of the major voices in the Caribbean literary canon. His bio is like three, four paragraphs long, so I'm not gonna read all of it, but, um, and please look him up if you have the chance. But my first question for you, Safia, is who was Kamal Brathwaite to you? So um, my first semester of college, almost by accident, I ended up in a class taught by Professor Brathwaite, um, was called Caribbean Poetry. And um, a very long story about how I'm bad at checking my email, but basically I uh, missed the deadline to register for any classes. Um, my first semester of college, I just was not checking the college email address yet. I didn't know that I was supposed to be doing that. Semester was about to start in like a week and they were like, are you coming? Um, so I went shopping for classes. This one, 
was the first poetry class that I found that was still open. Um, and I was like, okay, you know what? I like poems. I've like been on the DCU slam team. Let me, let me take a poetry class. But this is back when I thought I was going to be a psych major. So this was like my fun art class that I thought I was going to take. Um, and he changed my life. It was, first of all, the first formal poetry class I'd ever taken. I think um, I like had a life in poetry by then. I had a poetry community in DC. I'd been on the slam team, but a lot of my poetry education was that sort of kind of like horizontal lateral community based learning where just like one of my homies would learn something would be like, isn't this cool? And then I would have learned it too. Yep. So I'd never had a mentor figure in that vertical sense really. Um, and he was this like, by then like very old man and like um just like looked like a genius like beard down the hair and like used to wear these like big big glasses and what was really incredible about that class is we we got a bunch of his books and he would go through the poems line by line with us and just tell us how he made them and i at the time I wish I had known like who this man was at the time because that's actually in hindsight wild, that's wild. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but he would be like, "Yeah, here's what I was thinking, and here's what this reference means." And I was watching this movie, and this is how this image came to me. And it really, first of all, made it feel possible to just be a poet forever as like the main thing that you did. Because here's this man who's like probably in his seventies at this point and had just been a poet the whole time and was putting us on to how he did it. Um, so that was just as like being part of the class. And then when we, we I would like meet with him one-on-one -on -one and what was really a game changer for me as a young poet is he just took me really seriously. And mm -hmm. that I like cannot tell you how important that was to me at the time. I think um, my primary validation as a poet at that point had been through slam and that is through competition, which is not really a muscle that I had. So it was like, people like your poem, you'll get some points, but that wasn't like, no one was telling me why they thought the poem was important or what the, it was doing on the level of the line or whatever. So he would like take the time to sit with me and talk about my poems and just like talk about the world and history and post-colonialism and my life. And it wasn't like, he wasn't like the elder talking to the youth. He would listen to what I had to say and take me really seriously and debate me when he disagreed with me. Um, and it just really, I felt myself like blossom artistically, intellectually, just from the sheer fact of being taken seriously. Um, because at that point it still was like, I'm gonna at some point get a real job and poetry is a thing I do on the side because that's not who I am. It's just something that I like to do. And he made me feel like being a poet was like one of like the core elements of myself and that it was important and that it was powerful. Um, and it, I am prone to exaggeration. So I'm always like this like brow gel changed my life. But literally, literally, like he actually, actually, actually changed my life. I am, part of the reason I'm still a poet today is because Kamal Brathwaite like took the time to take me seriously and to talk to me about poetry and to show me the way. Um, he was a really good teacher, amazing poet. And then later on down the line, this wasn't through our like one-on-one -on -one relationship because I, I graduated, I like um, was not as good at keeping in touch as I should have been, but I kind of came to know his work in the world later. It like, I, I started reading some of his essays and kind of got to know him as a thinker outside of his work just on his own poems. And he um, originated the idea of nation language, um, which is like, I'm not from the Caribbean, but it, the concept of it is just so core to just the way that I make work and the way that I like conceptualize making work in English. Um, and, you know, you should read the book. It's, hold on, I think I have it here and it's short. Uh is it Islands? It's or? History of the Voice, um, which is just the transcript of a talk that he gave in the 70s. Um, and it like, it's like 50 pages. You can get through it in a couple sittings. Um, but he talks about how um, the English spoken in like 
former British colonies had been referred to as dialect up until that point, which he thought was pejorative and kind of low-key just meant bad English. So he was like, no, it's not bad English, it's nation language. It is like, maybe it comes from English, but my English is not your English. So you can't hold my English to the standards of your English. Um, and it really had just is, has been so, has given me so much permission to think, to like release myself from this idea of fluency and like mastering the master's language or whatever, because there are many Englishes and my English or the, the like mutated language that I choose to make with my Englishes are valid and are a language and that I shouldn't like worry myself too much about like measuring myself up against standards of fluency set by people who are not my people and who don't talk like me. And that's, I feel like this is just me thinking about what you just said. I, I know in the January children, like you go between English and Arabic a lot. Do you feel like that had something to do with it? Like learning that come out, like created language that wasn't like easy for white people to read a lot of times, but that, you know, is ultimately a true expression of like, what's going on with you? Yeah, I think what I, like the major takeaway for me was from reading his work, from reading his thinking, is that there's nothing wrong with writing how you talk. I think there used to be for me this large divide. This is like, when I'm like writing, I need to like be articulate or sound smart or whatever, whatever. And then this is how I talk when I'm like comfortable and not like performing fluency for anyone. And that combination of English and Arabic, when I'm like at my most comfortable, I am not translating. And when I am not translating, because I am at this point not fluent entirely in either Arabic nor English, I have like two half languages at this point. So if I'm sitting down to speak ex exclusively in one or exclusively in the other, part of me is translating and part of me is having to do the work of performing fluency to like prove to who I'm talking to that I speak this language. But when I'm at my most comfortable, when I'm like talking to someone who I feel like already has context for me, who I don't have to explain myself to, then the words just come out in whatever language they occur to me in. And that's, you know, that's my nation language. Um, and so for a long time, I was keeping the Arabic out of the poems because I was like, they won't understand what I'm talking about. But who is they, you know? That I think had to be a, an important question that I had to ask myself. Who, like, I know it's like, who do we write for or whatever, but quite literally, who is like my metric for if this poem makes sense? Is like, if this poem is written with like my mom and my little brother and my two childhood best friends in mind, then if it's in that like hybrid language that we all speak together, they're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. If like XYZ Ivory Tower poetry editor is like, I don't speak Arabic, that's like not actually my problem um, because that wasn't who it was addressed to in the first place. Word. Um, shout out that, uh, Safi with the bars. Uh, I don't want to go for this too long, but I also want to acknowledge, like, shout out all the people in the chat from everywhere. I know there are a lot of, like, people who are, like, thinking about writing right now. Um, Safia said, uh, write how you talk, uh, and stop worrying about them, because they suck. Um, I'm pretty sure that was, that's what you said, right, Safia? Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to, okay, great. Um, okay, uh, more questions. Um, so, speaking of people who are interested in your process. Um, do you, where did this poem start for you? Um, was it like a first thought or first word that you got on the page um, that you can remember being like, this is gonna start this poem or this poem is gonna happen now? So you, what was unique for me about the process of making this poem is usually, I wrote, I wrote the first draft of this poem the day that I found out that Professor Brathwaite had passed away and that's not usually usually like I need to like chew on something for a long time before I can like use my poem brain on it um but I don't know I mean part of why it felt more possible I was in a workshop at that time where um I had to write a poem a week for workshop and so I just felt like very in shape in terms of like mm -hmm. I couldn't like sit around waiting for like the muse to descend. I had homework due. 
Um, and so just like the, the ways that I get arrive at a poem just felt a lot more accessible to me. Um, it wasn't actually about like inspiration or the muse or whatever. It was like, okay, under these conditions, I am likely to be able to write a poem. And those conditions were available at the time. Um, the day that I found out that he'd passed away, um, my childhood best friend, Orad, was visiting me from DC. She'd come here to Oakland. And it was one of her last days here. And we decided to rent some bikes and bike around Lake Merritt, which is like 10 minute walk from where I live. Um, and we like packed a bunch of snacks, including a bunch of little oranges, like, like cuties, I guess they're called, those little, little mm. easy to peel oranges. Um, so we like went maybe three quarters of the way around the lake and then we like found a little sunny spot to sit down. And I hadn't looked at my phone in a while because I was on a bike and I'm not, not such a good biker that I can just be texting at the same time. Um, I pulled out my phone and my friend Suheili, who had been, she was the TA for Professor Brathwaite's class when I was a student. She was a grad student when I was a freshman. Um, and she let me know that he had passed away. And so then I just like, you know, the images of the lake and the oranges were quite literally because I was eating yeah. oranges at the lake. It's not a metaphor. Um, and I just, I don't know. I think I, the thing with elders, with like a lot of the elders in my life is I uh, always take for granted that I, I think I'll, I always think I'll have more time. And with Professor Brathwaite, I think I just like thought about him every day for years and didn't reach out as much as I could have because I was like, there, there will always be more time. He's busy. I don't want to bother him. He like, it's like always like a little bit of like deciphering I had to go on and try to email him. He's a little older. Um, so I was like, let me not bother him. Like, you know, this is not like email is not like the medium in which our relationship shines. And because of geography, that's primarily the medium that we had access to. So I always was like, I'll write to him tomorrow. I'll write to him tomorrow. I'll write to him tomorrow. And for years I didn't. And then he died. So I had to be like, all right, I will write to him today. And unfortunately, it has to be under these circumstances. But the way that I make this right for myself is that I need to sit down and I need to write to him, like I said, that I was going to do for years. Um, and so, you know, obviously, it came out in the form of a poem because uh, I'm not like a dazzling emailer, as anyone who's ever emailed me can attest to. Um, the greatest emailer in the world. Don't. Thank you so much for telling me those lies on my behalf. Very, very kind of you. To I'll tell, like yeah, that. I know. Um, <laughs> um, what else? The poem initially, I mean, it still kind of is, but I, um, whenever I don't know how to answer a poem, I will reach for form. It started out as a ghazal. It still is like almost a ghazal. The N words mm -hmm. drop off in a couple stanzas. Um, my name is in the last stanza. There's like a bunch of stuff that, of the, the constraints of the form that got lost, especially as it moved through more drafts. Mm -hmm. um, but initially it was like rough little hustle about like being at the lake, eating oranges, thinking about my teacher. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it was funny. I We were reading the poem together and we saw that my teacher line at the end. And it was like, this almost feels like a form the way it keeps coming back, but then it broke halfway through. Um, Okay, I'm seeing, I'm gonna ask one more question just so we could, because we got a whole bunch of more questions um, and it's not all about my questions. I feel like my questions are pretty great, whatever. Uh, but, are great. Okay. oh, thank you. You didn't have to say that, but now that you said it, everyone heard it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you just mentioned it, which makes me kind of want to ask about it because you mentioned the the pith and peel and that's where it comes from. Uh, shout out, it wasn't a metaphor. But there's another image in here that I feel it uh, comes back twice to image from. You say, um, I think later on, to explain again about the drum. Um, and I'm curious, what did the drum mean in this poem? And then maybe what did the lesson of the drum mean between you and now? So the drum, in the case of this poem, was a metaphor. Um, when he would talk about it, I think he literally was talking about drums, but I 
one of the biggest takeaways from working with him, especially like up until that point, my own, the only space in which I had been writing poems was for Slam. And that was like primarily those poems were written to be experienced sonically. And so it like, right from the beginning, the way the poem sounds out loud was like an important element of like the checklist of is the poem done. And then I get to college and I meet all of these like snobby people who have all these ideas about like page versus stage poetry and like really trying to die on the hill of that binary. Um, and it did not serve me. It was not what I was interested in doing as a poet because it also felt like it limited what I was interested in doing as a poet. I like, it matters very much to me for the poem to look good on the page and to like visually take up space on a page in a way that feels intentional. It also ma matters very much to me for the poem to sound good out loud. I think if people are gonna take the time to hear me read a poem, like it has to be, I don't want them to be like, oof, I, I like this poem better when it just was me in my head reading it. Um, that feels disrespectful to the, the reader and the listener and the poem. Um, and Professor Brathwaite was always talking to me about rhythm in the poems. Um, he'd be like, the rhythm in this is off or listen to the rhythm of this poem. And it just, it was very, it gave me a lot of permission, a lot of validation um, to hear this poet who had like a bajillion books proved that he could write a poem for the page um, talk so much about sound and like, not like sound in the lyrics, literally sound, the rhythm of the poem. How does it sound out loud? Where is the poem's drum beat? Where is the poem's heartbeat? Um, and it, you know, it still is like in the way that I write and I revise today, I'll make a draft of a poem. I'll read it out loud to myself. Um, I will catch something with my ear that I didn't catch when I was just reading, looking at the poem with my eyes. And that's, you know, that all comes back to, the drum is kind of a, a catch all for all of that information. Hmm. Word, uh, shout out that, shout out the drum. Um, and uh, we're not gonna, yeah, I think somebody put it in the chat, the poem's heartbeat. We're not gonna break that down, right? We don't have time. Um, but what we do have time for is to tell you about some of the stuff going on right now. I think, um, Joseph, our person, might be about to come back, but if not, I'll just keep talking. It doesn't matter. I am back. Thank you. Whoa. What a wonderful <laughs> um, segue there. What a great transition, Kenny. Um, I'm, oh, I... <laughs> you're really good at this. You're really good at this. You're the one. <laughs> um, first and foremost, thank you all for the first half of the show. I am thoroughly enjoying this conversation, and I hope that you are also. We are at our quote unquote commercial break here. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to show you the thing that we are all um, here uh, to, um, what brought us all here. The workshop is on a website and I wanted to show you guys that website real quick. And then we're going to have a very special treat, um, which will be uh, an introduction of Safia's new book. Um, but if you'll rock with me for a quick second here. So this is the new um, LMS Voice website that we have spent a lot of time building. And as I said, it is a free resource for teachers and other humans out on the world. Uh, we have um, this curriculums page, which is probably our most robust section right now. Um, most of them contributed by uh, Mr. Brian Hannon, but every month, uh, until my uh, fingers break, we will be adding a new curriculum with a different collaborator. Um, and so these are our first uh, six curriculums that will be going up. So starting uh, next month, we will be doing, uh, we do it for the culture and so on and so forth. Many different curriculums and lesson plans on many different topics until this thing is so big that we have to um, have its own search engine to find things. The whole idea is, is that there are a lot of people out there with a lot of wonderful ideas who want to find a space where they can share those ideas. And if you're one of those people, feel free to holler at us because you um, could be added to our curriculum database. Um, we have this beautiful workshop here, or this beautiful poem and a whole bunch others. And they're all searchable um, by theme and tag and things of that sort. 
All right, so please feel free to find us, join us, um, and share this with all of the people that you know on the planet, all of them, every single one, even the ones that don't like poetry, um, because there are going to be a lot of non-poetry things on there too. So with that, I throw it back to our esteemed host, who will now host, with a plural, who will now share and introduce Safia, who will be reading some things. Right. Throw it back. Thanks, Joseph. It's thrown. Caught. Uh, Milka, I don't know if you want to do um, real quick uh, half and half for telling people about Safia's upcoming project that they're going to pre-order before tonight is over. Um, Sorry, I was trying to figure out this unmute button. Um, yes, uh, that should be good or I, I'm down. I bet. Um, so about home is not a country a mesmerizing novel in verse about family, identity, and finding yourself in the most unexpected places. For fans of the poet X, I am not your perfect Mexican daughter, and Jason Reynolds. Because, you know, who, who doesn't love James, Jason Reynolds? Um, Nima doesn't feel understood by her mother, who grew up far away in a different land, by her suburban town, which makes her feel too much like an outsider to fit in, and not enough like an outsider to feel that she belongs somewhere else. At least she has her childhood friend, Afam, with whom she can let her guard down and be herself until she does it. As the, as the ground is pulled out from under her, Nima must grapple with the phantom of a life not chosen, the name her parents didn't give her at, at birth, Yasmin. But that other name, that other girl, might just be more real than Nima knows and more hungry. And the life Nima has, the one she keeps wishing were someone else's, she might have to fight for it with a fierceness she never knew she had. Elizabeth Acevedo, Acevedo describes it as nothing short of magic, one of the best writers of our time. Thanks. Um, great. Milky, you have a great reading voice. I feel like I would, I would <laughs> listen to you read bios often. Um, okay, yeah, sweet. but uh, Safia, would you like to grace us with that excerpt from the, from the pre-order? Sure. Um, and thank you all for reading the description because I am still at a point where when someone's like, what's the book about? I, I can only tell them like beat by beat everything that happens in the book. I don't know yet how to sum it up. So thank you Just for doing every that. time it's like, okay, let me take you from the top. Uh, walk <laughs> <you> through. <laughs> all, right, all right, so page one, right? Page, um, it opens. Oh, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read two short little sections um, because the book is, uh, if I'm being honest, pretty sad, but has some fun moments. I think I will read one thing that is sad and one thing that is fun um, to give y'all kind of the full experience, the full range. Um, this first section is called Mama. Of course, I know my mother is lonely. Her days and nights spent mostly in the company of ghosts. So much of who and what she's loved she speaks of only in past tense, though mostly she keeps quiet. I can't help but imagine that her life was enormous before we came here, loud and crowded and lively as any party. And then the final notes of the song and everyone is gone except me. And I feel my own smallness as I try to fill her life's empty spaces, though they gape around me like the one pair of her high heeled shoes I used to love to play with when I was little. So much of our life feels like sitting at a table set for dozens who will never again arrive. The two of us surrounded by empty chairs. My mother is lonely and I am her daughter, her only. I think that might be why I'm lonely too. Um, so that was the fun poem, if you can't tell. Um, and then uh, here is the other poem. Um, where is it? Okay, Haytham lives in my building, which isn't actually surprising since it seems everyone from our country immigrated to the same block of crowded apartments. It's Saturday morning and he's ringing the doorbell, frantic and falls inside when I answer, sweaty and rumpled and still in his house shoes, coughing with a little joke in his eye. His grandmother opening his t-shirt drawer to put away the laundry found his secret pack of cigarettes, which he doesn't even really smoke, which he tried to explain away while dodging the slippers aimed at his head. Who knew Mama Fatheya was so athletic? 
everything always so funny to him. She chased him out with cries of disgusting, disgusting, and where else was he going to go? My mother hasn't left yet for work and makes us tea boiled in milk, poured into mismatched mugs, and hands us packs of Captain Majid cookies she gets from the Bigala that Haytham and I call ethnic Walmart, where we buy everything from bleeding legs of lamb to patterned pillow covers and cassettes covered in a layer of dust. She never seems old enough to be anyone's mother, so pretty and unlined and smelling always of flowers. She clears the cups and wipes the crumbs from the table and our faces in quick movements, pins her scarf around her face and leaves for work. Haytham isn't wearing shoes so we cannot go outside. We instead spend the day playing our favorite game, calling all our people's typical names out the window into the courtyard. Muhammad, Fatma, Ali, Bidur, to see how many strangers startle and look up when they are called. Sorry, right. thank you so much. Give it a... <laughs> if my phone was not uh, in my hand, I would be clapping. You could hear me clapping. I'm just, I'm so mesmerized. Hey, I got you. I got you, Malika. Thank it's... you. Thank you, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I will be taking on the next section and this will be our cultural section. Um, so these questions will kind of stem more towards understanding, uh, Safia, more about um, your background and that relationship to poetry. And um, I think the my first question to start uh, would be just, you know, given all the works that you've written and the next book that's coming out, you know, how do you envision these identities um, that you're kind of exposing to the world? How do you envision that impacting generations of people that will read your work. Um, I know you definitely have set such a great uh, example for me to see. Um, and so I'm just curious to see how, how, it, how you envision this. Um, the, first of all, thank you. Um, I, to be honest, I like have a very hard time thinking in future tense or just like doing the act of envisioning in the first place. Um, I feel like my whole life has been like a choose your own adventure novel and I can see like this and maybe the one step in front of it, but sometimes not even that. Um, and I'm just like, do I want turkey or tuna in my sandwich? <laughs> you know, that like it's, you know. Um, so I, I mean, I hope that my work will be useful and helpful to people other than myself. Um, but I don't know that I know how it will be helpful to people other than myself. I can, I think I like, I know myself and I know the people that I have been and the readers that I have been. So um, a lot of my work has been just trying to fill in the gaps of where I like, would open a book and hope to see myself and would at best see like a fraction. Um, and you know, everyone's identities are intersectional. Um, even if they think they're not, everyone's identities are intersectional in some way. And I think I just got so used to, as a reader to thinking of my intersection as fragmentation and being like, okay, I can be represented, but only in part um, and I need to just be okay with that. And then I started writing and realized that, that there was something I could do about it. Um, but again, like representation stuff is tricky because I, my eye is my eye. My eye is not, like I think of myself as a very community minded human being. But I am never under the illusion that I am like speaking for anyone other than myself. So my I is not a we, not because I don't care about other people, but because part of my caring about other people is that I hold the deep belief that everyone can speak for themselves. So I'm like not out here trying to be like, hello world, this is what it's like to be a Sudanese American black Muslim woman Sagittarius. This is like the, the, the holistic, um, report. hold on, one second. <laughs> I live in a one-bedroom apartment, one second. Shout out to Sadies in the chat. 
Sad I know I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> it's the, it's the I signs. died in my bio. Mm. Um, sorry, I live in a one-bedroom apartment and we are on simultaneous calls. Um, <laughs> but I think it's very easy to fall into the trap. People like locate when I say people, I mean white people. So let me just say white people, I think, are always looking for a like a narrative to be made easy and soundbite and like neat and digestible. And so I think it is very easy for someone who is not of my community to read my work and be like, this is what it is to be a Sudanese person. This is what it is to be Muslim. This is what it is to be black. This is what it is to be from Washington DC, whatever, whatever. And I don't ever wanna give someone permission or an excuse to be able to read my work like that um, because I love my community and I love my people. And the way that I am showing that love is to to like try and like combat any narratives that we are a monolith in any way i like my hope is if anyone is like reading my work for anything other than poetry if they're like trying to mine my work for like information about sudanese people or whatever what i hope is that they will then go and read a gazillion other sudanese writers to start to piece together just the like great extent of that tapestry of voices because I couldn't even sum up like one one thousandth of what it is um so it my hope with my work is that I can like stay in my lane and uh make work in my very specific corner um and that will reveal to people that it's just one corner of this greater I think I already said tapestry but it's a word I like tapestry of like voices and thinkers and writers and that people will keep going you know I like don't want people to like arrive at my work and stay there it like I like my poems as much as whoever but like keep going that's you know there's like so much more um so that is I don't know if that's what I envision but I guess that's what I hope the first word that pops to my mind is just like fear fearless just because I think that's really difficult to kind of continuously like be your own example. And like, I, I read in an interview um, that you did that you write to make sure you exist. And like, I was curious, you know, like, what do you do to remind yourself that you exist, you alone in your whole self exist? Hmm. This is a tough question. I think what's been really important for me because you may have noticed like my poems are not so happy, you know? Um, and I think what I'm trying to do for myself is yes, through the poems, I'm making a record for myself of like the fact that I was on this earth and because the poems are like in a book or whatever, like that can't be erased. But I think I'm now giving my per myself permission to like, think about other ways of making poems because it like what I have now is like a robust archive of like all the ways I've been unhappy um and that like believe it or not like I'm okay I don't know what like I don't think the poems really reflect that but like I'm fine um and I I don't know I don't quite have the answer but I think it's important for me to like Kind of start to undo this narrative for myself too of the tortured artist or whatever i think there are like there is a way in which i like get to make my art and to like do difficult work without it like costing me something important because i think one of the earlier ways i was taught to make poems um i don't think slam is necessarily like this anymore but you know, back in the olden days of like 2008 or whatever, it really, you know, trauma scored. Um, and I have trauma. So I was like, all right, bet I like, I've got something for you. But it, it, I think what I internalized from that was that the most interesting stuff about me was what hurt me the most. And I actually, when I take a step back and I think about it, I don't think 
That's true. I think maybe that is one of the less interesting things about me because who among us has not been hurt? You know, that's not my like unique thing. We all have trauma, you know, like patriarchy and, and violence and racism and Islamophobia and xenophobia. That sucks. I'm not contributing anything new to the conversation by like revealing the ways in which it sucks for me. Um, so I think I, I like want to find a way to make it clear that like the poems are dealing with difficult subject matter but if I'm writing about it now it means I've already processed it and that I'm okay about it now I like I'm not going to write from the open wound anymore because it's easy but that's not sustainable I'm trying to be still making poems 10 20 15 30 years down the line and if I have to choose between making poems and being happy Loki, I'm going to choose being happy I love poems I love poems but I like love myself a little more Safia, the way you pulled an answer out of a question I felt was unanswerable. I just, you're so impeccable. I just want to- Milko putting the trap cards on the-, on the <laughs> <laughs> I asked them not knowing if there was an answer uh, and you just did phenomenally. Um, so phenomenal that we, we got to move on to our next section, um, which is questions from the audience. Cause I don't know if I can think of another question for you. Um, so I'll start off, you know, Claire Scroggins from uh, St. Louis Park High School uh, in St. Louis Park, Minnesota asked, you know, what are you reading this year? Um, so I, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of rereading for a class that I'm teaching. So I um, am rereading that Brathwaite text I showed you, History of the Voice. I'm rereading How to Write an Autobiographical Novel by Alexander Chi. Um, just reread both of Richard Sykin's books, Soft Science by Franny Choi. Um, and then there, let me see, well, it's January where books have come out so far. Um, I'm really excited to read uh, Mahogany L. Brown's Chlorine Sky, which is also a novel in verse. Um, so I think that may be I just got a notification I got packaged. So I think that might be what's in my mailbox as we speak. Uh, so I'm super, super excited to read that book. Um, I uh, just read um, Taylor Jenkins reads The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which was like a very juicy, like kind of novel that's fun to read in the bathtub. Um, what else? I, I'm being taught by Louise Glick this semester, so I'm uh, reading a lot of her work. I have a big, like, new and collected of hers, um, and I'm spending a lot of time with the poems from Averno right now. Um, and then the New Generation African Poets chapbook comes out, chapbook like box set comes out every year, um, and the one I'm rereading I read this first I think in November and I'm obsessed with it so I'm rereading it now is a chapbook called Enumerations by Sadia Hassan oh wow you've right. added books to my list yeah never forget that Safia manifested that book being in her <laughs> <laughs> that's what a flex <laughs> um okay we got more audience questions uh forgive me if I mess up your name um we got Abigail Liu from Claremont High School in Claremont, California, shout out Claremont, California, asks, what advice do you have for those who are just beginning to write poetry, who feel insecure about telling their story? Um, first of all, I don't think you have to write about anything that you don't want to write about. Um, I think like capitalism or whatever, like has us all under the belief that you have to like mine your every autobiographical moment for art to sell to the world you don't really have to do that you can write about whatever you want to write about um so if there's something that you feel you're not ready to write about you'll get to it don't worry like let yourself believe that you have time to get to it and in the meantime write about the stuff that you are interested in writing about right now um i think for any writer not just beginning i think like any writer who is choosing to continue to write should be reading more than they write. I think um, your taste as a reader is uh, 
most of the information you need about your voice as a writer. I think the stuff that you're responding to when you're reading, the devices, the subject matter, the forms, that I think is information to like your writer self about the kind of work that you're interested in making as well. Um, and I'm not saying like bite from the people that you read, you shouldn't do that. That's a lazy way to read poetry. But I think like when you're reading and you're really like paying attention to your reaction, it's like, like first level is like, wow, yes, this is a hotline. But like, what, what makes it hot to me? Is it that there's like consonants happening and it feels like music to me and that's what's actually really exciting to me? Okay, let me make a note of the fact that like when I'm reading consonants, it feels good. So let me try writing some consonants um, and so on and so forth. Um, also just write it like, I think taking pressure off the act of writing is very helpful. It doesn't have to be like, every time I sit down to write, it's to make my magnum opus. Like just like write bad poems, write good poems, just write. Or shout out that. I think maybe we have time for one more audience question. If you want to read it, Milka. Uh, sure. Um, I think Alan Freytag from Fairfax High School in Fairfax, Virginia asked, how would you describe how you bridged your written poetry to speaking out loud, speaking it out loud? Um, I don't know that I ever had to bridge them. I think I, my, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but my like initial poetry training was for performance. So I was being taught how to read my poems out loud while I was learning how to write poems. So those two are forever going to be inextricably linked in my head. If a poem doesn't sound right to me out loud, it probably means there's something wrong with the writing of the poem. Um, and then, but I also like need for the poem to feel intentional on the page as well, because I think it's still the same poem, but the poem has two lives. There's the life that it has to live when I read it out loud to a person who doesn't get to see how I mean for it to look. And so I have to make sure that I am like communicating that poem in the way that I intend for it to communicate, to be communicated. And then on the page, I need for the poem to appear in such a way that if I'm not there to read the poem to that person, they still have a sense of the rhythms that I'm interested in, where I want the pauses to be. Um, if it's lowercase, I want it to feel a little softer, a little quieter. If it's capitalized and punctuated, I want it to feel a little crisper, a little louder. Is it in a prose block? Is it in couplets? All of that, I think, is like sensory information that is meant to substitute for the fact that I can't be there, like over your shoulder, being like, "No, you 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 should pause there before you go on to the next line." Word. Um, thank you for answering those. Thank you guys for sending questions in. Um, we will be doing this again, so send in more questions, and maybe we will have more time for the next person. Uh, I don't know if we'll have Safi again. Uh, I'm around, hang out. Yeah, Safi is around. You know, she's in Oakland, but you know, it's DC. Uh, so uh, we are at everybody's favorite part. Uh, this is our first time doing it, but it's everybody's favorite part. Weird questions. These questions, they're weird, but like, they matter. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I need yeah. to ask them. So hopefully we can get through at least three because uh, we want to know weird things. Um, Safi, the first question. Um, what is a smell that as soon as you smell it, as soon as it goes into your nostrils, it just takes you back? So what is a smell? You smell it and you're like, dang, man, I remember. I feel like that's my relationship to almost every smell. Isn't it that like smell is like the most immediate trigger of memory? But I will, okay. When I was a kid, my grandma used to wear uh, Chanel Number no. Five perfume, but I didn't know it was Chanel Number no. Five perfume. I was like, "This is just the way my grandma smells." Um, and then, when I was an older kid, I had an aunt who like used to. I mean, at the time, it felt like a great gift. Now I'm like, all of them are free. But it, she would bring me like little like bags of perfume samples that she would get at department stores, and I was like, "Wow, th is this luxury?" because I'm, I'm experiencing luxury right now. Look at all these perfumes I got. Um, and one of them was Chanel number no. five. And the first time that I sprayed it, I was like, 
like this doesn't make sense these people are selling the scent but like this belongs to my grandma so what <laughs> like what is really going on here Dang. Safia asking me important questions at a young age um okay that was my weird question uh Milka I think questions. one of the questions I want to know really 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 need to know you know if your life had a theme song what would it be well um hard because I don't know like theme song like the song that plays in the opening credits or like um like if my life had to be translated into song it would be this song because it, I don't know if this is the truth but what I would like for the theme song of my life to be um would be the opening song in The Lion King, um, which is also a great uh, alarm clock ringtone. Um, if you ever want to just wake up feeling like <laughs> empowered and dramatic. Um, so I think that would be my chosen theme song, even though I don't know that it necessarily corresponds with the kind of life I am living. I think, I think we could, let's, Let's find some Safia clips. At this point, we're always going to play that song. And now we know if you do come back, we'll play that song. When you like <laughs> um, okay, uh, one more weird question. Um, what is your favorite cliche? Ooh. Um, you know, I'm not so snobby. I like most cliches. I think things become cliche because they're actually true. Um, <laughs> but you just like say it so much that it's like not like special phrasing anymore. But you're just, you know, the reason they still exist is because they're so true. Um, I love, uh, let's see. How you spend your day is how you spend your life. Um, I love uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Um, I, I don't know. I think I also, um, not to get too deep into this, but... I like, because I wasn't in the first part of my life an English speaker, I kind of was late to the game on a lot of idioms. Um, so a lot of those are still like new and exciting to me. I'm like, damn, for real, people say that? That's good writing. Um, so I'm not so jaded about cliches. A lot of them, I'm still like, I can't, like none of them come to mind right now, but I'll like, every now and then be watching a movie or something and be like, that's so beautiful. And my partner will be like, you, you know, that's like a saying. <laughs> so actually I am pro cliche. That was, well, it. it was teamwork for the it. dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work for me. Um, these things are true. Um, okay. I really feel you on those American expressions because sometimes you just, you just don't know. <laughs> Um, so it's 9.03. Uh, I know we were supposed to live, leave at 9. I would like to give Safia a chance, though, if you have any last words, any last, any last things you want to leave the, leave the listeners with. Um, um, no, thank you. I feel like now that everyone knows my stance on cliche, I can yeah. go in peace. Um, but thank you all so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. Um, and such like a, a special space that you all created. Um, and, you know, it is uh, great to see faces from my life in DC here in my life in Oakland. Thank you so much for being our first guest here at LMS Voice Chat. Um, so, so, so excited um, uh, that we get to see your face again uh, and that we get to read your words again so soon. Um, on behalf of Brian and myself and my mama and my two sons, um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, teachers that are here, please invite your students next time to come. Uh, you see what we're doing here is mad chill. And I am so impressed that our number state is, we got started at 95 and stayed above 90 the entire time, which means that our host 
Kenny and Milka must be doing something right. Um, can we please give them a round of applause for being wow. so magnificent this evening um, and so welcoming to our, 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 our guest. Um, please check out the website. If you sign up for the website, um, which is free, we'll have your email and we'll let you know when the next thing is happening. Um, we'll be making the announcement for the next guest next week. Um, and on February 15th, we'll be launching a new curriculum and the after series, which is uh, local and national poets who have come by my home studio uh, to record their poems and a workshop for that poem so that you can write after it. Thusly, the after series launching uh, February 15th. You see what we did there? We, we be I words, big brain we be words, crazy. We be words. Uh, Safia, uh, be safe, hold it down, wear a coat outside. Um, much love. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I go don't buy know how to complete these book. things. You ain't got to go home, but you know, actually, you're already there, probably. So, good night. Good night. <laughs>